are currently at sea on board a ship called the S.A. Agullis II and the ship was actually named after the Agullis current. We are deploying many different types of instrumentation to try and understand the Agullis current, to try and understand the biology, the chemistry and the physics. And the Agullis current is an extraordinarily important current in terms of global ocean circulation because it connects the Indian Ocean with the Atlantic Ocean. So the current flows along the east coast of South Africa, transporting warm and salty Indian Ocean water. When it reaches the tip of South Africa, it actually does something called a retroflexion, which means it turns back on itself and heads back into the Indian Ocean. But in the process of retroflecting, chunks of the Agullis current break off in what is known as Agullis rings, basically eddies, large spinning vortexes of Indian Ocean water that travel into the South Atlantic Ocean and eventually, we think, link up with the Gulf Stream, providing an important injection of salt to the Gulf Stream. Now the Agullis current and the Gulf Stream are two important limbs of this global ocean conveyor belt that transports heat and salt around our planet. So in order to understand a little bit more about this important current, we are here today doing some groundbreaking research. This voyage will look at sampling the Agullis current along a line called ASCA, which stands for the Agullis System Climate Array. During this voyage, we're using various marine instrumentation to sample the ocean, as it is important for us to understand what the Agullis current is doing during winter time. The Ski Monkey is a towed camera body that gets lowered behind the vessel. It's attached to a conducting cable. So once it touches the sea floor, the ship starts moving at about 0.5 to 1 knot. And during that time, the Ski Monkey skis across the sea floor, hence the name Ski Monkey. And that's the time I take photos and I take videos of the seafloor. So the great thing about the Ski Monkey is that it is not as destructive as other techniques previously used in the past or more traditional methods as we would say, like our trawling and our dredging. Because it basically the only thing that touches the seafloor are the skis. So in that way we are sampling but we are not harming the environment. So it's good for fragile environments, for marine protected areas that we would like to conserve. It's equipped with a camera, it's equipped with lights to light up the seafloor. We have lasers to scale the image and we also have a flash so that we can get some good quality crisp images from it. So the Ski Monkey gives you a live feed so it's able to do this because it's attached to the ship on a conducting cable and that sends information from the Ski Monkey to a laptop. So I'm sitting at the laptop and I can see exactly what's going on on the sea floor and I'll take images and videos at set intervals. So the Ski Monkey is quite unique in that it gives us a a real-time view of what's going on on the seafloor. So you can see this complex interactions between animals that you won't be able to see if you're trawling a troll net or you're trawling a dredge across the seafloor. So you can see what's happening in real time. You can see how they behave and what, what they're actually about. And it allows us to paint this picture of the seafloor so you can see which habitats occur where. And I think that's really amazing. It's not something you can get from other instruments. So that makes the Ski Monkey really unique. Uh, we started uh, with some samples from 10 years ago um, of fish species in the Agalis current and we dissected their guts and we looked at 10 years ago what the numbers of plastic in the guts were and we followed that up with uh, samples every now and then from, from 10 years ago to see if the numbers of, of, of plastic has changed in their guts. Um, we've looked at animals that live on the surface, so they would be affected by plastic that's floating in the middle of the, the sort of the Agalis current, so sort of about 1,000 to 2,000 meters deep and right down to 3,000 meters deep. And unfortunately of all of the 18 species that we've sampled, all 18 had microplastics in them. So at the moment uh, we're looking at using the Newston net. Uh, it's a net that floats along the surface of the, of the ocean uh, and it samples what we call the sea surface micro layer. This is the largest ecosystem on earth and probably the ecosystem that most people know nothing about. Uh, it's actually only a few millimeters thick and most of the life uh, lives in that layer. So it's an incredible ecosystem full of life, full of diversity and unfortunately also full of plastic. 
uh, and we're hoping to quantify the number of, of um, microplastic pieces because the Newston net is a very small mesh size, so it samples um, very tiny pieces of plastic with what we're seeing uh, in terms of big plastic. So we have observers on the top of the, of the ship and they're doing visual transects looking out to sea and seeing if they can see any big pieces of plastic. And so we're trying to see, it's called the missing plastic problem, trying to quantify um, with the numbers of big pieces that we're seeing why have we got so much small plastic and and that's what this 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 specific trip is about so as you can probably see from the swell behind me we're experiencing very rough weather we're currently in the middle of a frontal system and we are also in the center of the agullis current now the agullis current is an extraordinarily powerful current on average per second it transports the equivalent of 45,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools, which is an incredible amount of water. And we are right now taking oceanographic measurements, and it's quite hard for the ship to stay on position to maintain the same location because it needs to counteract this enormously powerful uh, current below us. that's directly behind me. This is actually the CTD sensor. This is what measures conductivity, which is a proxy for salinity, temperature and depth. It also measures oxygen, turbidity and fluorescence. Now these are directly measured by the CTD as it goes from the surface all the way down to the depth of the ocean. During that process, the information is conveyed back to the CTD operator in the lab to my left. The CTD operator then identifies depths that are of interest. And on the way up, these bottles over here, which are called Niskin bottles, are closed and in doing so, capture a snapshot of the water properties at these various depths. And the biogeochemists are specifically interested in the information that these bottles contain. I'm here to collect nutrients, chlorophyll A and zooplankton. To collect nutrients and chlorophyll A, I need water coming from CTD at different depth. And for the zooplankton, I use a special net called the drift net. Why do we collect nutrients and chlorophyll A? 90% of the oxygen that we breathe in comes from the ocean because phytoplankton as the main producer that gives out the oxygen that we breathe in and it also manufactures food for other animals in the marine like your herbivores. The zooplankton we collected to conserve it because it forms the main food source for fish and other marine animals. We are doing this research in order for us to gain understanding and knowledge about our marine productivity. At this moment, I'm sitting on the SI Agalis doing science and looking at the life in the Agalis current and trying to understand how it works. My speciality is parasitology. So we are here to look at the symbionts of all these different organisms we find. Now the symbionts is the relationship one animal has with another one. So it's usually much smaller. And so far, very little research has been done in the Southern Hemisphere with the small symbionts and the parasites and almost nothing with the Agalas current. Now, how we get these parasites, there's two ways. We start off with the bongo nets, which we drag behind the ship to collect phytoplankton and then what we are interested in, the zooplankton. Because a lot of parasites starts off their life or the life cycle in invertebrate planktonic hosts like the little copepods and all the other small fishies. And then from there, we look through all the microscope and identify the hosts first, the copepods and the little fishies, and then we look at what parasites are there. After that, we use the dredge, which is a dredge being dragged 
across the ocean floor to collect larger invertebrates like your echinoderms which is your urchins and your sea stars and also some gastropods your sea snails and slugs because that is usually also a part in the life cycle of these parasites and then we look at the plankton in there and we look at what kind of microscopic organisms are on the microscopic organisms and the parasites and it's very important to know this because they play an incredibly big role in the food web which you just don't understand yet but also they play an important role in any higher mammal because most parasites have a life cycle that comes from the smallest possible thing through different hosts and then ends up usually in a higher vertebrate and most of the time in a higher vertebrate mammal and that includes your whales, your seals, your dolphins and humans. So there you have it, a summary of some of the science being done on the Agullis current by a few of South Africa's brilliant young marine scientists. I think I speak for everyone when I say what an honour and a privilege it is to be at sea. So thanks goes to Seamester, to Asker and to the SA Agullis too for hosting us on this incredible expedition. <laughs>